Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for, thank you for coming back. Um, we'll just make a start with, with Iris Kramer's presentation. But just to let you know, because of some of the issues that we've had with technology, we're going to slightly change how we're structuring the session. So, Iris, you'll do your talk, and we'll take questions from the room and online. But the next two, which are pre-recorded again, will run each video one straight after the other. And then we'll do questions for, for the two presenters in one go, so we're not chopping and chopping and changing. So over to you. There okay, it is. Thank you. I don't, just, just hold it like this? Just hold it. Should, okay. should work. All right. Well, <laughs> hello, everyone. Um, I am Iris, and um, yeah, I'm talking to you about how we can use AI to automatically detect archaeology, um, and then especially focusing on like how uh, for 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 really large landscapes, how you can provide solutions. Um, so a bit about myself and my background. So I am an archaeologist by training. I'm from the Netherlands, where I did my uh, uh, undergrad in uh, Leiden University. And I uh, specifically went to the UK to study computer uh, archaeology, um, looking at GIS uh, at University of Southampton. And then during that, that master's, I was really interested in using automated approaches to automatically detect archaeological sites. Um, and uh, it worked quite well, but I saw that the, the best thing was not to use something that I initially used, which was pattern recognition, really much like telling the, AI, the computer what to look for, like circles and lines and edges. But going into PhD that was doing deep learning, where you actually just give the AI um, uh, known examples of what you want to what, what you want it to find, and then internally that model comes back with um, uh, um, uh, the circles, the lines, and the things without us telling it. It will it will learn those features, um, and yeah. So the PhD worked really really well. Um, and I was really excited that actually maybe I can commercialize this research into a company and like make it accessible because of the scalability of this kind of approach. We could make it accessible across the country um, and use it in really exciting ways. So I founded the company two years ago um, and I've had uh, many different support from Geovation, Royal Academy of Engineering, um, NESTA, UK Space Agency and European Space Agency. And we had a really fun project last year with Dick Ventures funded by NESTA where we were looking at crowd intelligence combination and, and AI. And then more recently, we've now completed two commercial projects with the Forestry Commission and the National Trust, looking at uh, detection of rich and furrow for the Forestry Commission um, and looking at preservation. And then for the National Trust, we were looking at digitizing um, uh, historic maps and those two um, examples is what I'm going to focus on most in this um, presentation. So. As I quickly alluded to uh, with what AI really does, or the deep learning specific uh, AI, it, it trains the AI based on these known examples. So you can have these roundhouses and small cairns that you already know of, but then you create a box around and you let the AI learn what it needs internally, like circles or lines, to find that object. And then um, you, can, you can use your trained AI model in a new area or over the same area to look at things you might have missed or that you want to um, look at later on. So it, in this case, um, we were able to find a roundhouse on the Isle of Arran. Uh, we found many, actually. And this one was one of the, one of the exciting things for Historic Environment Scotland, where um, this roundhouse was not known before. Um, but they did, uh, in a desk-based assessment, have a look uh, thought it was an interesting enclosure, looked at it in the field, um, but uh, yeah, they in the field disregarded it, uh, mainly because it was really overgrown landscape, um, so you couldn't really see the roundhouse anymore on the ground. Um, so yeah, it got, went out of the records, but with our AI, it came back into the records, because just putting a bounding box around it, saying it's a roundhouse, and then, and then having another look at it with, with fresh eyes, um, made sure that then uh, they thought that, yeah, this is indeed um, a roundhouse. Um. <laughs> um, okay, so I'll just continue a little bit. So yeah, we've been we've been so that was in the PhD. I was really looking at these these bounding box kind of detection. So really looking at um, putting squares around each object. And that was yeah the PhD research. But really, archaeology doesn't fit within a square. We we look at landscapes many different shapes and sizes. So then I started furthering the development during the, during the company, then looking at creating a segmentation model, which can just become a polygon of any shape and size. 
Um, and we were able to train that model on enclosures, round um, uh, mounds, linear earthworks, quarries, um, and enclosures include like big hill forts um, and um, moated sites and such. So a big variety, a big variety of things. Um, so yeah, here is an example of those different objects that we are now able to detect in England where we've, we've trained this on different scheduled ancient monuments. So you can see some of these enclosures, hill forts that it has been found in blue. Um, and then um, you can see in black lines the quarries that we've been able to detect and then in yellow lines like the mounds, the burial mounds. And one of our most exciting, uh, not so recent dis discoveries, but we were, we were now able to detect deserted medieval villages with quite high accuracy. And that was a really fun thing for me to see because we didn't actually have that many training examples of it. And that's something that deep learning really needs. Lots and lots of training examples to see and learn the variety of things. And what we found that we had lots of examples of mounds, but actually the AI still confuses a burial mound with a round barrow. Uh, with a roundabout, um, <laughs> which is annoying, but with with um, deserted medieval villages. Yeah, come Sorry, in. Um, oh. we have a frozen camera feed. We just need to fix it real quick. Yeah, very, go on. Very sorry about the interruption. <laughs> just continue talking. So yeah, the deserted <laughs> medieval villages is, uh, for me, is, has been really exciting to, to find those accurate model. The reason why it's so good at it is because it, there's nothing in the landscape really that looks like it. Um, so it's a, it's a very unique view <laughs> from the deserted medieval villages. Um, here on the left you can see one example um, which is actually from the area uh, that we're working on with Dig Ventures and um, yeah there also we we saw some interesting examples of where um, the, the crowd uh, interacted with, with what we had found uh, with the, with the um, uh, deserted medieval villages. So yeah, the AI is quite good now at finding deserted medieval villages because it's such a unique pattern in the landscape that nothing looks like it, no modern equivalents and no ancient equivalents that are that, are that distinctively the same. So yeah, the AI is, is good if there is a pattern that is very unique uh, to, found, to find, not so much like uh, mounds, burial mounds, which are often confused with roundabouts. Um, yes, <laughs> I'll laugh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and similarly, linear earthworks is another example where uh, there are so many modern equivalents that look like it. Um, so a dike uh, is another thing that we've got in modern times and in ancient times that, we, that we've used. So yeah, there were confusions there and also like um, linear earthworks are confused with like modern roads or railways or things like that that have got this embankment going on. So a, a linear earthwork example here, the AI created around a, um, uh, the banks of a hill fort, which it also thought was a linear earthwork, which kind of makes sense maybe um, to, to, to create that, but it's just interesting to look inside the AI brain of what it creates, uh, something different than the labels we gave it. Okay. So then from England, we also looked at Scotland again, the same, um, I worked with uh, Dave Cowley, who I also worked with in the PhD to just um, train the, um, the AI on some of their uh, manually created labels, which include uh, trackways in blue, banks in, in uh, green, um, then ridge and furrow in pink and lazy beds in red. Um, you can see the patterns there. Um, and then um, I want to focus specifically on um, some shielding huts that um, we were able to find. And then because we were able to do that across the, the whole island, we can then come up with a heat map of where those shielding huts have been found. And you can see that very clearly in something like when you overlay it with a map of the, of the, um, the Ordnance Survey water courses, can see that they're, they're indeed at the, the clusters which are in the picture show uh, confluence with the, um, the river um, uh, feeder streams. Okay, so now moving on to <laughs> what, I'm, what, I'm, uh, what we've been doing commercially then, um, looking at the, uh, for the Forestry Commission, uh, the project where we are detecting ridge and furrow with the AI and then using computer vision techniques um, to, to assess what preservation is like there, um, maybe whether it's narrow or wide ridge and furrow so that we can inform that to, to derive a, um, a period. Um, so 
we've been using um, uh, and comparing our results with data that was provided uh, from the AGR from Northumberland County Council. Northumberland is the area that we've been looking at, and we've used um, specifically looking at detecting bridge inferral on LIDAR data from the Environment Agency, and then um, some of these locations that we were able to, to find with bridge inferral have been then uh, looked at as well by, um, by uh, members of the Forestry Commission, um, and we've been having lots of discussions on what we've been able to find and what it means um, with different experts, such as Dave Cowley from Historic um, Environment Scotland and Strat Halliday, um, who's been, yeah, both been really interested to have these discussions with us. So kind of what comes out of it for finding Ridge and Furrow is something like this, where the AI just creates a polygon around um, what it thinks is Ridge and Furrow. And then what we do um, is create a grid around it so that we can start looking at each individual grid so that we can find out what the, uh, the, the height is in that grid uh, of the, of the, or the median height of the region furrow there and then uh, come up with some classifications. So we find uh, in an initial process the lines of the region furrow and then we can establish what the direction is of the ridge and furrow and then we group those uh, grids together so that we get uh, roughly a field uh, that, that belongs to that ridge and furrow. It is, it, broadly, it's, it's grouping these based on the direction and also the width. So if, there, if it, there's a sudden change of width, then also it subdivides again uh, the grids. So what we then have done is, yeah, look at this median height. So you can see that in the orange, there is the higher ridge and furrow, and in the blue, there is the, the lower ridge and furrow. Um, so that, it, for example, here, you can see that, um, yeah, that's really low. And actually, um, in the detection of the AI, it, it, it roughly included this as well, but then it was so low uh, in our approaches that we've removed the lowest kind of uh, level of preservations um, in the detections. So yeah, out of it, we've created then a table with, with a lot of this information that we've been able to gather. So here I've, I've pointed out the, the, the depth, the height measurement, um, which goes from this field in the top, which is uh, 10 centimeters to 15 centimeters to 20 centimeters or 25 centimeters, uh, different kind of uh, levels. And I'm gonna show you some more examples of um, uh, what we've um, been able to create. So this kind of, table um, is very similar to the national mapping program. That's kind of what we've been using as an example. To so then, uh, we've added some uh, extra fields, um, which can be created into a common section as well. So we have been speaking with Northumberland County Council how they would like to receive this data in the end, and this is kind of what they what they agreed on. Maybe other county councils would like to see it maybe in a common section because there is no um, yeah availability of this kind of fields, but. Okay, that's a tangent. Um, so you can set then uh, all these height measurements, you can set maybe like a threshold of what is exceptional preservation. Um, and so that's something that we, here we've set the threshold to, um, to 20 centimeter, and then you can start looking at um, what areas um, are then of, of great preservation. Um, and you can, yeah, play around with that and see, um, yeah what you want to do with that. So then we are looking at the, the width measurements um, where this red area is becoming, is the, is the widest um, area. Um, specifically, it's like, that's kind of like eight meters and then up the top, it goes to, to, to four meters. So there is a much more uh, narrower ridge and furrow. Um, and then we've been starting to look at like, okay, what makes a narrow and what makes a wide ridge and furrow? Are there any data points that are already available for us so that we can use that as like a guidance? We didn't find clear guidance on what, what is wide and what is narrow ridge and furrow. And so what we've been able to do is um, create this plot based on the national mapping program along Hadrian's Wall. And anywhere where we found ridge and furrow as well with our AI, we've then seen what the, what the labels were from uh, um, whoever did the national mapping program there, um, and we were able to see when they said it was narrow and when it was wide and what our computer vision approach said. So we roughly found that there was a peak for, for narrow region furrow at uh, five, or at like, it ends around a five to six meters. Um, and then, so that's, that's where we have created our cutoff point, but that's still something that is up for debate and can be, can be switched when, when there's more clear guidance and something like that. Um, so yeah, then here at the bottom you can see now, now pointed out that where we've said that, that it's narrow or not, which is something that is used in the National Mapping Program. 
So then finally, what we've, um, we've wanted to look at is the period. So yeah, the wide and narrow does in, does, is, is important for that, but also the variation, the, the, the change of the, of the um, ridge and furrow. Um, and then we wanted to find especially the reverse S pattern to, to look at the medieval things. And so we thought about it a long time. How can we best uh, see that? And we've looked at the, the variation of the line. So the, the post-medieval ridge and furrow will be dead straight and narrow, um, and uh, that will be the same over the whole field. So we found that if there is more variation across the field of the different um, angle direction, then that's more likely to be um, uh, medieval. Um, so yeah, these um, then these then are are, are yeah uh, what is being used for that. So you can see in this example then um, some something that comes out as medieval is in green for us. Um, the blue is then the the post medieval, and the red is we don't really know. There it might be either or, um, and we have found that it um, it works especially well for finding. Uh, post-medieval because of that dead street, uh, th those, those parameters are most um, successful. For medieval, it's, it's still a little bit more difficult to say whether that's indeed medieval, but then it does, it does help you to look at those examples. Um, and the reason for that is that like, if there is a lot of disturbance, then also the variation will change a lot. So that, will, that, that reduces the accuracy on the, um, on, the, on the reverse S and the medieval side. So we... Um, we then create also a confidence score of how certain we are, and we find that, that we're, we're least certain about the medieval classifications, and we're least certain, specifically this one looks at then how, how disturbed is that field. If there's too much disturbance, then, then the, the, the uh, classification accuracy goes down. So for example, the yellow examples are the lowest confidence, and that's, those are the ones that are close to roads, um, other disturbance, field boundaries, rivers. So, then you can you can look and classify based on that as well. Maybe maybe remove the lowest uh, confidence or something, depending on your use case. Um, yeah. So yeah. Then finally, what we've also we really wanted to align with the national mapping program. So based on our directional outputs, we've also been able to then create a line through the center, which is used in most of the uh, data that we received as well, so that it can tell you what the direction is. And so we've yeah we've also shown that in the in the table where we say uh, based on the cardinal direction uh, uh, where it's going. Um, uh, then finally we've added some more data because it's not so difficult for us to to extract that and that's potentially a lot of research opportunity there uh, just finding out what the what the exact slope is of that particular polygon um, what the altitude is of that location uh, what the direction of the aspect um, the, is and, and and such so yeah you get a lot more data like for example the slope map um, here you can then yeah do more research um, so we've then overlaid our results with the National Mapping Program to see like how does it how does it relate to some of the research that has already been done, and you can see that some of these areas uh, have been completely leveled in the meantime. Um, and so yeah, we are not able to find them with lidar data. We might be able to when we add area of topography, um, but yeah, our our project at the moment is very much finding the the earthworks and the preservation of it. So yeah, it is successful in some cases like this. We can see that indeed that is le that is less obvious ridge and furrow, and here you can see it more pronounced. Um, and um, yeah, and then also the Forestry Commission has done some of the field work on lo different locations in the landscape where they, from a, from a road, could see the ridge and furrow, and they've taken some snapshots for us that we can then compare to the results that we had. So um, this is, a, a, the orange here is between 20 centimeter and 31 centimeters, which correlates to um, what was found in the field when, uh, when looking at that. So that is really um, great to see as well, uh, the feedback coming back from the field work. And then what we would see is like the period, our period um, also is um, green and medieval. So that also <coughs> then mainly correlates there. So here, like a quick little fly through of the area to give you an idea of like, okay, what does that look like in the landscape when you look at it from a larger scale? So, um, yeah, we find here that along this uh, river there's a lot of lovely virgin furrow um, that um, can be found. So, yeah, you can see here uh, that, like, the red is the, the, the higher virgin furrow. So, 
is it scalable, this kind of technology that we've applied in this one area? Yes. Uh, we've been able to, to, to download all LiDAR data from the environment agency, process it in, in all different ways that we can use it for the AI, and then uh, run it across the whole county. So that's super exciting, so that we can like look at where the patterns are. Um, and um, then the next step is to go for a national scale. And yeah, actually, I think oh, the only thing holding us back at the moment is LiDAR availability. But it seems like that should be really soon that we've got like national coverage for the one meter DTM. Um, so yeah, overall, like really successful on uh, detecting the AI uh, or using the AI to detect rich and furrow and also successful in finding uh, the height, the period, and even like way more than, than maybe is necessary for an assessment like this. So we can, we can get lots and lots of, of information that maybe you wouldn't normally be able to do um, uh, in an assessment. We weren't very successful actually at finding cord rig, which is one of our main objectives and hopes that we would be able to find that, but actually it's really difficult to find even on the LiDAR data, so the one meter DTM might not be good enough to find it even visually, and then also we didn't have enough examples to train the AIs. AI is really, really hungry to find lots of, um, yeah, needs a lot of examples to find the patterns, um, especially when they're not so obvious. Um, so yeah, next steps is like, for the Forestry Commission to like find out how to um, uh, integrate some results like this into their uh, approaches. And um, uh, starting a wider discussion is, is also really important for us to find ways in which like something like this can be used in management. Um, and then, uh, yeah, also like having a discussion on what is that line uh, of preservation and where, where do different people find that that threshold is. And so that's all really important part of, of the discussion so that we can maybe yeah have like really landscape scale wider national skills uh, understanding of, of what it is and for us like being able to find out what that where that narrow versus broad kind of um, um, uh, differences is also something that maybe we can find out with data but also with discussions um, how am I doing for time oh I'll just continue it's just talk for hours difficult to tell with the um Oh, so, right. Um, so I'll just talk for hours. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> About another five minutes or so. Okay. Okay. It's good. So, yeah, there's a lot of research potential from some of the results that we've been able to pick out. So here I've created a map of, like, medieval versus post-medieval um, assessment. Here we've got medieval, there we've got post-medieval, and all the points here show us where the uh, deserted medieval villages are that we were able to get from the, na um, the county council. So, yeah, here's, like, a heat, a heat area that is within the... Um, uh, medieval period but not so much in the post medieval period and then we've been able to zoom into that area with all these different deserted medieval villages and wow there's a lot of rich and furrow there um, then this the opposite one uh, this one is more for the post medieval period um, where there is a lot of like centralized around this uh, valley um, uh, area just this example I've just added so that you can see that there's not that much rich and furrow every everywhere but there is still uh, a lot of rich and furrow uh, in the landscape, as you can see. So now our next project, so I've got five minutes to whiz through this one, which has been with the National Trust, where we've looked at um, uh, digitizing historic mapping. So we've been able to look at the 25-inch uh, imagery from around 1900, and then also the six-inch imagery from around 1950s. Um, so different scales, so we could, we could um, look at that. And the data comes from the National Library of Scotland. Um, so initially, the first step for our research was to, to, to gather the data and to select areas for where we would then manually digitize all the orchards that we are known in that image. Um, and um, the next step is then to, uh, to do that. So here you can see a square. So we created a, a square, um, different squares across the country, and then digitized those. So you can see some images with uh, orchards and some without. We have found many challenges um, because maps are hand drawn um, and drawn from different periods. So the the the, the map from Herefordshire has been created uh, just after the one from Gloucestershire. So there weren't orchards then. So there there are some um, problems there with uh, with maps, and then also different uh, cartographers maybe put 
put the trees exactly in the place where they were, or and others would, would place them just in a grid. So when we are training the AI and we wanted to find both the symbol and the gridded pattern, then it gets confused around the areas like these where maybe they're, they're not so gridded as we would expect them otherwise to be. So it gets a bit worse. But still the AI, this is the result, the green result is where the AI put the boundary. So it's, it's still roughly doing a, doing a good job there. And then, um, yeah, on a larger scale, you can see something like this appearing with the green examples are all where, they, where the orchards were drawn, and then the red examples is exactly where the symbol was found. So we found a combination of, of template matching and deep learning really useful um, to say where and where orchards weren't. So our best results was actually on the 25 inch, which is not surprising because it's better resolution and the, and the orchard tree is more distinctive than the, the, the deciduous tree, which is actually used in six inch mapping. So that deciduous tree, we really needed that, that gridded pattern. So if there wasn't a gridded pattern, then um, it wouldn't be doing so well um, on the six inch map. So here you can see the results from on a national scale then we've been able to map all this. Um, so then the reason what you can see here is that it thinks there are a lot of orchards in the north of Scotland here on the six inch in map in the middle. Uh, and that's actually not true. There are not, <laughs> there are not that many orchards there. Um, but that's just a, just a technical um, problem with the six inch map uh, where the orchards look like lots of other things. But most interesting is that like we can see these, th these three different time slices, 1900 on the left, then 1950s, and then today where you can clearly see that there was a, a, a lot of more activity of orchards orchards in the 1900s than there are today. So this is the first time that anything like this has been mapped on that kind of scale. People have been working on mapping orchards manually for like six years within the People's Trust of, um, uh, of uh, Biodiversity and they've been doing that uh, uh, yeah, for such a long time and we've been able to do that with an automated approach in a very short amount of time. Um, but yeah, this can inform lots of, lots of new ways of land management as well. Um, so for example, we've um, been able to assess that actually 80% of all the small orchards in England um, and Wales were lost since 1900 and they've been mostly replaced by uh, farmland because yeah, grain is maybe more profitable than apples or, or other orchard trees. Um, and uh, also, yeah, urban expansion has also removed lots of the orchards. So that's kind of what we've been able to draw out, but there's so much more research potential from a data set like this. And so next steps for the National Trust, they want to make this data available for non-commercial uh, purposes. So that's really, I think, great kind of way of, um, of uh, yeah, making that research possible. And then um, we are looking as well for the next stages at, at detect, using the AI to detect different woodland symbols um, and really make like a more uh, understanding of what the biodiversity was like on a large scale um, in the 1900 period. So then just generally what we're going to do next, we're going to be working on uh, more pilot studies, like I just suggested, um, but then we also want to make these national maps available um, on a large scale um, through either our own platform or through resellers for like land development and for construction so that this kind of um, data can be used um, in the sector. And also just generally, we really want to have a, a sector-wide discussion on what we've been developing and how it could be used. Um, so yeah, I come at this from an archeological perspective then a research perspective, but not so much like I've got two years of experience working in commercial, but yeah, I need to have those discussions with everyone um, to see how people would like to see this being used best, uh, with best practices. Um, so yeah, we want to organize a round table session, um, um, maybe in a couple of months, um, or maybe like, maybe like five months or so, to, um, to bring lots of people, stakeholders in a room and talk about how this could be used in, in different settings. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's it then. Thank, Thank you. you.